This is Parnell Hill, your instructor for strategic marketing. Um, this is the uh, lecture number two for week number two. Um, let me let me mention that if you have been having trouble with Wimba, um, I just learned that uh, Wimba likes Firefox better than it likes um, Internet Explorer, or, um, Chrome, or any, any any of the other browsers. So try that. Hopefully that'll, that'll make things easier for you. All right. So this is really the crux, the underpinning of the whole strategic marketing course. And um, so this is going to be kind of thick and juicy, so I'll lean into it. Um, I'm going to talk first about the elements of strategy. We talked last time about how strategy is kind of this overused management and marketing word. So we're trying to put some meat on this skeleton of what people call strategy. And so these um, these are some elements that I want to talk to you about. At the end, the, the, the whole point of strategy, like I mentioned in week one, is to align what it is that an organization is good at doing or what gives them competitive advantage. Uh, with what the you know what, with what the four P's do you know the, the promotionalism and the pricing and what product you're offering and how it's distributed. So let's 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 start with the kind of the business model, which are the four ways to make money. And on planet Earth, there really are essentially kind of four ways to make money. And uh, I know that's kind of simply put, but the fact is, every way to make money or make a living or to do business is a variation on one of these four themes. The first of which is to sell existing products to an existing market. So, for an example, you might sell, if you're Nike, you might sell your existing Nike basketball shoes to existing basketball players. That's a very fine business model and uh, well used and very very popular. Another way to make money on planet Earth is to sell existing products to a new market. So you might take your Nike basketball shoes and sell them to people who don't play basketball, like I don't know, rappers or you know, young people who want to act like basketball players or whatever. And Nike, for example, has done this quite brilliantly. Um, they, you know, many of us have a pair of basketball shoes with the Nike logo on them, and most of us are professional basketball players. Third way to make money is to sell new products to your existing market. So continuing on with the Nike metaphor, if you're Nike, you can sell a new product to an existing market. So not only can you sell basketball shoes to your basketball players, as you did in your existing to existing model, but now you can sell basketball shorts to your basketball players, or basketball jerseys, or basketball socks, or basketball jock straps or basketball headbands or whatever you whatever you want. But you get the point. So you're taking a new market and you're taking sorry, you're taking a new product and you're um, taking advantage of the fact that you have an existing market and you're just gonna load that market with your new offering because your brand has already been set and etc. Finally, uh, the final way to make money on planet Earth is to sell new products to new markets. So again, using the Nike example, you can start selling uh, hockey skates to hockey players, which indeed Nike has successfully done. So there you have it. Um, you might guess, you might intuit that um, of these four ways to make money, the first one, existing to existing, is the, is the least risky. Um, it's also potentially the least profitable. While conversely, selling new products to a new market, that is the most risky and, again, potentially most profitable. Uh, we'll touch on that more later. The second of these elements of strategy, strategy is the core competency. Now, this is a, a, a word, again, that is another word that gets tossed around a lot, um, and it shouldn't. Uh, a core competency is different than a simple operational competency. Um, an operational competency, conversely, is something you just do well, um, and it might it might be a really important competency. Um, 
But in order for for your competency to qualify as a core competency, at least in the, our context of strategic marketing, in order for it to be a core competency, it has to it has to fit a couple of descriptions, and those characteristics are the following. It needs to give you a competitive advantage. For example, if you're really good at uh, I don't know making widgets, but there's 17 other companies in your hometown that are also really good at making widgets, then it's not really a core competency because it doesn't give you a competitive advantage. It's just something that you're good at. Um, so that's the first one. The second one is that it has to make you some money. Um, that, that's true whether you're talking about a nonprofit or a, or a for-profit organization. And you can just exchange the word make money for uh, make enough money to keep the operation going if you're talking about a, non, if you're talking about a nonprofit. But indeed, in order for it to be a core competency, the thing that you do well has, in, in addition to giving you competitive advantage, it also needs to be profitable enough to keep you up, to, to sustain the, the enterprise. The third characteristic of a core competency, as opposed to a regular operational comp competency, is that it can't be readily duplicated or not easily duplicated. If you look at some old textbooks from the 70s and 80s, it'll say um, not, comp you know, can't, cannot be duplicated. It's kind of softened now these days, um, and the idea is that it's not readily duplicated. So I'm kind of an old schooler, so when I'm doing consulting work or looking at an organization's comp court, and I try to find if they have court competence or not, I try to hold to the old the older definition, which is that it can't be can't be duplicated because if it can be duplicated and you're successful, it most certainly will be duplicated. Now, if you don't have a core competency by this very strict definition, it doesn't mean that you're out of business. It doesn't mean that your business is going down the tubes. In fact, um, you'll look at some organizations during this during the course of this of your coursework here, and a lot of organizations don't have a core competency by that very strict definition. And you know, you might look at it and say, well, they're doing fine or they're doing okay. Fact is, they may be doing okay, but they are at a competitive disadvantage if they don't have a core competency. Again, it doesn't mean they're out of business, it just means they could do better. And organizations can acquire core competencies. Your core competency might be that you have Albert Einstein working for you. And if you don't have Albert Einstein working for you, you can hire Albert Einstein away from the competition and thereby acquire that core competency, for example. Same thing with other natural res other resources, natural or human or any other kind of resource. They are acquirable. You can buy out your competition. Um, you can hire better salespeople, etc. Point is, if you don't have a core competency by this very strict definition, you can get one. Thirdly, there are nine tactical initiatives which I'm going to go through um, in a minute here. And these are um, sometimes there's actually a Kotler, a, a Phil Kotler book out there that covers these some of these nine tactical initiatives, and he describes them as strategies. And I think it's an unfortunate use of the word strategy. So I'm going to again go old school and call them some tactical initiatives. There are some marketing imperatives that go along with those tactical initiatives. So I think this will make more sense in the next slide, but hang in there. Next, there are market market or marketing opportunities. There are certain macroeconomic um, or microeconomic, I guess, but there are economic environmental um, uh, scenarios that avail themselves to marketers that are you know, and opportunistic marketers take advantage of those. Then there is the strategic alignment model, and the strategic alignment model is, again, sort of the, the guts of this course, and it's a tool that you will use for the rest of your life, I hope, um, to gauge whether or not your organization or any organization is strategically aligned. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about strategic alignment and misalignment to what that means as opposed to market dissonance, which are two different things. Um, and then finally, um, okay. 
And then finally, to finish up with the Chancellor and Gretel exercise, this is a way for you to practice using the strategic alignment model. All right. So the nine tactical initiatives are the following. These are ways to kind of win, win a battle or win a to win business. You can do so by using by having uh, higher quality. Uh, you can do so by having better service in competition. You can do so by having better prices. You can do so better prices meaning lower prices, more attractive prices. You can do so by acquiring by having more market share than your competitors. You can win or by one tactical initiative is to be more adaptive and the ability to customize your offering. Continuous improvement is another one. They all sound easy, but they're not. Product innovation is a whole course in this in this uh, um, curriculum. We've had it for one successful product development. High growth markets is another way to win. And exceeding customer expectations is the ninth. So the real this is the real important piece of this is the associated marketing imperatives that go along with these. If you went and asked some organization how they want to win, we named off those nine tactical initiatives, a lot of organizations would say, hey, we want to win by doing them all. We want to have higher quality and better service and lowest prices and high market share and adaptation and customization and continuous improvement and product innovation and high growth and we're going to enter high growth markets and we're going to exceed customer expectations. Well, the fact is, <clears throat> that sounds great, but organizations aren't built to do all those things. Most organizations, just like most people, want to be successful in every area of their life. But most people, throughout the course of time, find out what they're good at and what they're not so good at. And they lean into what they are and they lean away from what they aren't. And organizations should and do do the same. That's not to say that you shouldn't try to improve where you're weak. It just means that I could improve all I want, my, you know, my ability to throw a football, but I'm still never going to be able to throw it like, you know, Tom Brady or something. So I should concentrate on doing something that I'm better at Tom Brady at, like maybe marketing or something. All right. So if higher quality is the thing that you want to, to lean into, if that's what your organization is going to try to win through, then you better have a brand that um, is associated with higher quality. Now, Quality is, uh, again, another one of those words in marketing that gets tossed around um, ubiquitously. And it, 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 quality means something. Um, there are three characteristics of quality that I want to share with you that I want you to pay attention to. And one of those is that quality is a dynamic um, concept. That means that it changes in time. Things that, you know, what it, what is of high quality today might be different than what was of high quality 10 years ago. And we know that by our own lives, you know, what was a high quality car in the 1950s doesn't qualify as a high quality car in the 2010s. Um, another thing about quality is that it's um, hyperbolic. There is, it's almost inherently um, jacked up, inherently um, overblown, you might say. You you know this because everywhere you turn, people are saying, uh, well, we got the highest quality in the world. Hey, at Ford, quality is job one. Remember that tagline? Well, we know, just even intuitively, even if we know nothing about cars, we know that for Ford, quality is not job one. Ever heard of a little company called Mercedes-Benz or, you know, Ferrari or something like that? Everybody knows that there are more high-quality cars than Ford. So that's the kind of thing that drives people like me nuts when words get thrown along and it just sort of weakens and, and uh, diffuses the meaning of the word entirely. So that's the other, that's the other characteristic about quality, so be careful. And the final one is that it's subjective. So this has to do with heterogeneity. Um, that's what that, that means. Um, you, all of you, uh, your definition of quality is different than mine. And what you value in terms of quality is different than what I value in terms of quality. For my kid, <clears throat> a quality dining experience means it's full of carbohydrates and sugar and you know fast service and all that stuff. 
for me, quality has nothing to do with that um, when I'm having a, a you know, quality meal. And so you get my point. So quality is dynamic, it's hyperbolic, and it's subjective. So with that in mind, if higher quality is how you need to, how you want to win, then no brand better be associated with that. Let me take this opportunity to talk a little bit about brand that's it's up there. So brand is another one of those words that get overused. And um, so there, there are three elements of branding as well, and there's two ways to measure brand strength is what I'm trying to say. The first is uh, brand authority. And brand authority, that word gets, gets bandied about a lot, and it means a specific thing, and it's measurable. <clears throat> so brand authority is the amount of premium dollars you can get for your offering simply because of the brand. So, for example, Nike might be able to sell a pair of basketball shoes for um, 100 bucks, and an identical set of pair of basketball shoes that has the same functional utility that we talked about last week, um, made by Keds or whatever. Maybe they have, maybe they, always, they can only get 85 bucks for those shoes, but because it's Nike and because Michael Jordan wears them, that brand has some authority. It's the ability to get premium dollars simply because of the brand. Another measure of brand strength is brand recognition. And brand recognition is simply that. How many people in a given population recognize what your brand is? Brand recognition doesn't speak to uh, whether or not people like your brand or whether or not they value it. It's just sort of a, a blank recognition thing. And then finally, brand uh, loyalty. At what point do people leave your brand? It's sort of a mirror image of brand authority. So brand loyalty is at what point do people leave your brand for, for an alternative brand? That, you know, at, at what price do they leave you? So again, these are very measurable, quantitative things. It's not just some elusive, ethereal word that gets you know, tossed about by marketers all over the place. Don't be one of those people. All right. So the second offering is better service. That's the second tactical initiative. So if better service is going to be the way you're going to win, then you better have a service-based organization. And that implies training, in, in a word. So people like to say, yeah, we give better service. But if you really do give better service, then the people that you employ better know what your definition of good service is. So one question to ask when people say, yeah, well, we have the best service. That's how we win. That's how we compete. Um, we compete on service. This very next question should be, well, then what's your training regimen? How are your employees trained? What's their definite? What is every employee in that organization should be able to define what you mean by better service? It's just not smiling better or having brighter teeth or a nicer tie. It has to be um, backed up by a training regimen. Thirdly, low prices. If you're going to win by low prices, um, there's only one winner in that game. It's a very dangerous game to play. Because again, because there's only one winner. So if you're going to play the low price game then you better be the low cost producer. So cost, again, as you know, is different than price. What does it cost to make that widget? If it costs you $1 to make that widget, then you can sell it for $1 one. If it costs you $1.05 to make that widget, then you can't sell it for $1 one because there's a lot of business over time. And the person that, that makes it for $1 is gonna, can, you know, in, in the war of attrition, they win. So. Here's the, here's the test when people say, yeah, we have the lowest prices. The next question strategically is, well, are you the low cost producer? What does it cost you to make that widget? If you're, and of course, there are things like penetration pricing and um, you know, just to get into a market, that's, that, that's notwithstanding. But in general, if you're not the low cost producer, you better not be the low price provider. High market share. If you're gonna win through high market share, then yeah, better have your distribution house in order. Um, there are lots and lots of organizations. Well, I mean, I can name them in this town, actually. Um, that that is their that is their strategy to continually uh, acquire market share. Yet they don't pay any attention to, to distribution. What they try to do is sell more widgets than they did last year. So if every year is the plan is let's do what we did last year only harder. Well, that's not a winning. Eventually, that wears out. You know, it's not a football game. You can't just go there like new rock band, say, try harder, try harder, try harder, work harder, work harder, you went for the gipper. Eventually, you have to have something behind that that is strategically uh, placed. And in this case, it's distribution. 
whether you sell through a series of distributors or a network of distributors or whether you sell on the internet or whether you sell direct, um, whatever your distribution model is, it better be, um, it better be optimized if you're going to win by that, by that fourth tactical initiative, which is high market share. The next one is adaptation and customization. This is a really popular one, especially in our service-based economy. And if you're going to have, if you're going to win through adaptation and customization, then you better have an R&D group. And maybe it's a formally called R&D, or maybe it's just a group of people in your marketing department whose job it is is research and development and how to adapt and customize your offering, whether it's a widget or whether it's a service. But there better be, so again, if you're acting like acting like a consultant, and somebody says they want to they want to win through adaptation and customization. Or they want to compete via those two characteristics, then your question should be, well, what do you got? What's your R&D um, position? What does your R&D department look like? Next one, continuous improvement. Again, R&D is a big one here. And that's, this is, this was a very hot tactic, especially in the 90s and going into the, uh, the 2000s. The whole idea of continuous improvement is, um, sort of got popular during the Japanese automobile revolution here in America, where they were always, uh, their whole manufacturing uh, paradigm was about continuous improvement. That's why you have things like um, uh, whatever, uh, compounds and um, ISO and all of these things that are meant to sort of institutionalize continuous improvement. But that means that you better have a flexible organization and an organization that is good at learning. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the organization is just super smart. Um, that's a different thing than having an organization that is geared toward learning. So geared toward learning and flexibility implies that, or, that there's going to be mistakes made. And if you want it, it's kind of a paradox, but if you want to have continuous improvement, then your organization better be okay with people failing. Um, and some organizations just aren't. You know, some organizations are. You better get an A plus every time, or you're fired, or you, you know you don't make any mistakes. But you know, but go ahead and take a bunch of chances and be innovative, but don't make any mistakes. That's that's schizophrenia. All right, product innovation again. R and D features heavily here. If you're going to innovate, um, you better have the people that can make the changes to your product or offering on, under your roof, or somehow. Uh, you know, somehow attached to your organization. And then customer knowledge is also important. If you're going to innovate, you need to innovate according to what customers want, not just what your your engineers think they can do. It's not, it's not meant to be a science project. It's a marketing initiative. It's a business initiative. It's an it's a entrepreneurial enterprise. It's not just a you know, pull, out your, pull out your chemistry set and your tinker toys and sort of playing around. You have to make stuff, you have to innovate in accordance with what you know that customers want. High growth markets. This is always a fun one. You want to go to, you want to, go to uh, you want to make a lot of money, you want to be uh, successful, you want to compete, well then go to you know, Silicon Valley and make computer chips or something. But high growth markets imply that you have money to spend. Um, it's hard to get into high growth markets, and the reason that they're high growth is because they're attractive. And since they're attractive, they attract a lot of people with, you know, with money, with money to, to prosecute the business. So if you're going to do that, you better have money too. And secondly, it's not on here, but let me mention this: your organization better be risk tolerant. Again, that kind of like the, you know, the same thing with continuous improvement. Your organization better be okay with failing once in a while, because when you're, you know, trying to hit a home run every time, you are going to miss the ball every now and then, and so uh, you better be okay with that. And some organ again, it's a great question to ask organizations. Talk to the CEO and say, how do you feel about failure? Um, and then ask the people on the on the ground, the salespeople, how do you feel about failure? Uh, it's interesting to see what kind of different answers you get. A lot of times the CEO will say, Oh yeah, we're totally risk tolerant. We don't, you know, we're 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 cool, you know, we're very creative and innovative. But then the people further down the line say, Yeah, well, it's easy to say, but if I if I don't make my quota, I get fired. 
So that's a disconnect. Finally, exceeding, exceeding customer expectations. That's what's plain and simple. And a lot, again, a lot of service organizations lean on this one. You know, we we are the we want to make our customers feel you know exceptional every time they walk in the door. Well, then you better know what makes them feel exceptional. So customer knowledge is really important. So again, the question to the organization is, how do you gather customer knowledge? How do you know your customers? Well, they've been shopping here, they've been going to us for 50 years. That doesn't mean you know them. I mean, do you have a, a way, a, a, a process in place to continually gather information from your customer base? All right, I know it's pretty thick and juicy, but. So these are the, the as I mentioned before, these are the market opportunities. These are kind of the, the environments or the scenarios that turn up in the economy that marketers can take advantage of. And the first one is to deliver your product in a newer or, or better way. Um, so you know, the, uh, when I, under the heading of the four ways to make money, you know, existing products in an existing market, if you can do that, in a different way, a better way. So you're going to sell books, but instead of selling them out of your store, you sell them over the internet, that's the Amazon thing, um, etc. Second way is to uh, target your product or your service in a low supply area. This is a people do this intuitively. And you want to go where there's not a lot of competition, and so we're in the we're in the we're on the supply side of the economic equation, and our customers are on the demand side so we want to find a way where there's low supply and lots of demand again that's pretty that's a pretty measurable thing and it's not that hard to, to, to figure it out the problem ends up being is when you have a your institution is in, let's say you're a retail business you're a bakery or a whatever and you plant your business in a particular part of the part of the planet and then all kinds of competition pops up around you and you're sort of stuck there well a, Obviously, the internet has has mitigated that risk a lot. Okay, and finally, the the novel product or service. This is this is the classic one. So, a new product, a different thing. The iPod versus the the compactive. So, a new product or a novel product or a novel service. In our town, um, in the past, well, I can rem I remember when I was in college, my town, which was had. When up during my college years, my town got its first um, Asian restaurant, and it was like it was crazy. It was the most popular thing in the world. It was they had to chase people away from the place. It was so busy. Since then, a bunch of other restaurants have popped up, and that one is still there, but it's much less busy. And when you talk to the people there, they they remember the good old days when they were the novel product, they were the novel service in town. Alrighty, this one is um, this is the strategic alignment model. Uh, so, as I say, they're each silo. If you think about the four ways to make money, it's the first thing to consider. And then, what is your core competency? And then, which of the nine tactics are you going to choose? Um, which marketing imperatives, which market opportunities, and how are you going to use your tactical tools, which again are the four P's that we talked about last week. Each, when you move your way from left to right, each thing to the right should support the thing that's to the left of it. For example, so if you're going to pick of your four ways to make money, let's say your, your organization is, we're going to sell existing products to, to new markets. Well, then your core competency better support that. Your core competency better be something that supports the fact that you're going to take these existing products. So, so maybe you're, one of the core competencies might be um, you're really good at making those widgets. But you also better have as a core competency a way to penetrate new markets. Otherwise, your ways to make money, your four ways, your business model is not going to be supported by your competency, and you're you know you're you're headed for a twist. Same thing with the nine tactics. The nine tactics better support that core competency. So if your core competency is riding a unicycle, then which of the nine tactics are going to support that? Um, and so on down the line. Now, 
let me make a little point about strategic alignment and strategic misalignment and dissonance. Um, once you start using this this tool, this model, and it takes practice. That's not how you do it. I mean, the, the tenth time you do it, you'll be better at it than the first time you do it. Um, just like anything else. But what you're looking for is alignment or lack thereof. Places where where there's misalignment. Places where the thing to the right doesn't support the thing to its left. If that makes any sense. Um, and when it when you have when you um, encounter misalignment, uh, it is often referred to in other textbooks as uh, strategic dissonance or strategic alignment dissonance or strategic misalignment. So when you hear any of those terms, they're all synonymous. Um, I'm, I think I said the class is one of my pet peeves is when, when marketers or management people get so hung up on nomenclature that the conceptual stuff gets lost. So what I'm interested in is for you to understand the concept of this of strategic alignment and what you can call it, whatever you want to call it. You can call it you know, strategic crookedness or strategic brokenness and go on to I don't care. But what you're looking for is ways in which each of these succeeding um, silos, so to speak, uh, support one another. Having said all that, what's confusing is the term market dissonance. Market dissonance is different than marketing or strategic alignment dissonance or strategic dissonance or marketing dissonance. Market dissonance refers to the fact that even if you're totally supported here, even if you're, even if you do this strategic alignment model exercise and you find that everything is completely in order, everything is totally mutually supportive, it's not a guarantee of success, unfortunately, because of market dissonance. It may be that even though you're totally strategically uh, aligned, that there's still there's something else going on in the macro economy. I don't know, Hurricane Katrina comes to town, or the Great Recession comes to town, or your offering suddenly becomes unfavorable, or is it, deep, is it regulated somehow, or something. It just, it, it, the reason I mention it is to underscore the fact that just because you're aligned, it's still not a guarantee of success. It just makes you, um, it just embellishes your chances for success. And if you're if you're more, and, and very few companies are completely and totally aligned, but the more aligned you are, the more strategic alignment that you have, the better um, the better you are competitively speaking. And finally, the Hansel and Gretel exercise, and I'll, um, your assignment tab, it'll, I, I will put this in there um, in writing so you can so, so you can read it as well as hear it. The Hansel and Gretel exercise is aimed at getting you um, practice uh, so you can flex your muscles with the stuff for a while. And again, you'll get better at it the more, the more that you do it. Um, and it's meant, as the title of the exercise sort of uh, implies, it's kind of a working backward thing. And you follow the breadcrumbs to get back to your, to get back to your, your get back to it again, get back to where you started. So in the real world, when you're actually figuring out your strategic alignment, you start with the four ways to make money. You say, okay, what are we good at doing? You consider your core competency and you say, okay, well, here's what we're best at doing. We're best at selling existing products to, to new markets. And then you work that way. You work from left to right always. Because you don't want to just start out with the tactical tools where you're just going to start making your advertising and your promotional stuff without doing the you know without making sure that you're aligned and frankly that's what a lot of businesses do and that's trouble it's amazing how many businesses are out there that do just fine um, and start exactly that way so if you're hired when you go get your big six-figure marketing job after you get your MBA um, if you're hired into an organization that believes or that considers marketing to be just promotionalism, that's a big red flag. If you're not invited to the conversation or the meeting about which of the four ways to make money or what is your core competence here or what tactical initiatives are you going to employ, then you need, it's your, it should be your job to educate the organization that you need to be in on that stuff because how the heck can you have a decent promotional campaign or talk about pricing or consider pricing when you don't know the rest of it. It's, it's, a, it's a recipe for misalignment and 
for strategic um, alignment. So that's how that is supposed to work from left to right. However, the Hetzel and Gretel exercise turns this thing on its head. So what you do is you start with the four Ps and you work backwards. And it'll be, it's amazing how good you'll get at this. At first it'll seem you know, disconnected and counterintuitive and all that stuff. But just lean into it and you'll get better at it. So the idea, again, could refer to your assignment your tab. It'll, 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 it'll be explained in black and white better than I'll do it here because um, verbally it's just difficult to explain. Um, but essentially it's working backwards from the four Ps. What you will do is you will collect um, evidence of the four Ps from, from a given organization, like say some advertising. And if you look at that advertising, you'll say, huh, which of the market opportunities is this advertising trying to leverage? Is it trying to, maybe it's trying to uh, leverage the, uh, a new and novel product. So does the advertising say something about new and novel? Or does it say something about, you know, just like your mom used to make? Because that wouldn't be new and novel. Follow me? And so then you go work back to the market opportunities, which market opportunities, I'm sorry, which marketing imperatives are, are, are does this organization seem to have? And then the question is, does it? You can ask, you need to talk to the organization and figure it out. And back to the nine tactics, uh, through the core competency, and then the four ways to make money. When you talk to organizations, it's amazing when you should ask them what they're for, which, which are the four ways to make money they want to do, they will often say all of them or any of them. Well, of course that's true, but then you ask the next question, well, what do you think your core competency is? And then you give them that explanation of what the core competency is. Does it give them a competitive advantage of something to make money? And is it copyable? If they have a core competency, does it really match up? So if that's the exercise, um, that's the lecture. Um, again, check out the, the assignment tab and um, let me know if you have any questions.